This episode is brought to you by the Complete Concussion Management Continuing Education Platform. More specifically, the Level 1 course, Introductory Concussion Management for Healthcare Professionals. This course dives into the pathophysiology of acute concussion and covers all the things that happen inside the brain immediately upon impact and during the days and weeks that follow. We dive into metabolic dysregulation, blood flow impairments, autonomic nervous system dysfunctions, and heart rate variability, and much more. This course also examines the biomechanics of injury, looking at subconcussive impacts, as well as concussions themselves. We explore the research around concussion prevention protocols, and in particular take a really close look at neck strengthening protocols to examine the scientific evidence in support or potentially against these programs. In the final module, we take a very close look at chronic traumatic encephalopathy, otherwise known as CTE. This is the long-term neurodegenerative disease that's thought to be attributed to concussions or repetitive head trauma. And we take a very in-depth look at the evidence uh, around this, and we try to separate media hype from the actual scientific literature. This allows you as a healthcare professional to be able to answer your patient's questions more clearly and appropriately with the best evidence in mind. This course is meant for healthcare professionals, but is no means excluded to healthcare professionals. We actually made this course open to anyone, although the majority of people who are going to be interested in taking it are going to be healthcare professionals, and we do discuss things at a very, very high level for healthcare professionals, but we also know that there's a lot of people who are seeking information for themselves personally or for their family members or loved ones who currently have concussions and just want to learn more about the topic. By all means, you are also welcome to take this course. So please click the link below in the show notes for the level one course. Hello everyone, welcome to Ask Concussion Doc episode number 77. Uh, First off, happy new year. It's been a while since we've done an episode because we've been on holidays and Hopefully your holiday was better than ours. We've been all sick over here. Um, baby's got pneumonia. She's on antibiotics now, so everything's good. But uh, it was a rough holiday for us. I'm kind of getting over something, so if I start to cough, I apologize. Uh, but onwards and upwards for 2020. Thank you all for joining us. If you're joining us live or tuning in on YouTube or listening to us on the podcast. Our first episode is going to discuss some new research regarding blue light therapy, and sleep. Sleep is a very important topic for concussion. Oftentimes when I have a concussion patient, I will look at all of their symptoms as a whole and try to figure out, you know, what is the one thing that if I could fix this one thing, it'll have a cascade effect to fix other things. And so, you know, the way that I I talk about this frequently, excuse me, is what is the thread that I can pull on that will unravel the entire, you know, sweater that is post-concussion syndrome. And the way that sleep interacts with so many other processes, sleep is often the one thread that you can pull on. If you're not sleeping well, you're going to have the symptom of fatigue. You're also going to probably feel a little bit foggy. You're also going to have um, concentration difficulties and cognitive problems. Sleep deprivation on its own, with irrespective of concussion, irrespective of brain injury, if you take people and just deprive them of sleep and then administer cognitive tests, they will have cognitive impairment, similar to a concussion patient. So when you have a concussion patient who's not sleeping, and they're also reporting, you know, fatigue, fogginess, troubles concentrating, difficulty remembering, all these other things. Is that because of concussion? Or is that because they're not sleeping properly? Chicken or the egg? So if I can control sleep, and if I can get this person sleeping better, I can often get rid of the fatigue and all the other symptoms that go along with it. So that's what I mean by that. What's the one thread I can pull on that it's going to unravel a whole bunch of other things? Um, anxiety, if you throw anxiety in there, anxiety by itself can cause a lot of the same symptoms as concussion and it can also create sleep disruption or sleep disruption can also create increased anxiety. So you have a chicken or the egg scenario. So if somebody has anxiety, 
and sleep disturbances, you want to start tackling both of those things kind of simultaneously because going after one, you might be missing the other and you're not going to be able to have a good outcome. So sleep is often the thread that I want to pull on. As I said, by itself, if you had didn't even have a concussion, but if you have a sleep disruption, you're going to have cognitive impairments, you're going to have headaches, you're going to have all of the other symptoms that might go along with concussion. And I think in concussion, because the overlap, because the symptoms are nonspecific, um, you end up with a whole host of other problems that you're trying to figure out which one is actually driving the symptoms. And that's really the difficult thing with PCS cases. So sleep is also extremely important and critical for healing following brain injury or injury in general. It helps to flush out neurotoxins. It helps to restore damaged DNA in neurons, helps to increase the production of oligodendrocyte precursors, which are needed for the production of myelin, which helps with signal transmission of the brain, also helps with uh, protection and buffering of the brain and keeping things within the neuron. So it helps contribute to uh, the sheath around the neuron. And it does a number of other important things. So sleep is vitally important to regeneration, repair, and neuroplasticity, if you will. According to a study by Howell in 2019, 45% of adolescents report having sleep difficulties in the first 10 days after concussion. And no surprise, this was also correlated with having worse symptoms, having an increased symptom burden. When you start looking at chronic patients in the PCS stages, this, these numbers climb even more. Brooks and colleagues in 2019 found that 62% of adolescents who were an average of six months after injury had clinically significant insomnia. This was associated with higher concussion symptoms, higher anxiety, and higher depression. So now again, chicken or the egg. Are they depressed and anxious because they're not sleeping? Or are they not sleeping because they're depressed and anxious? So again, like I said, when it comes to these types of things, you have to make sure you're addressing both things simultaneously. The most common sleep complaints in adults with persistent concussion symptoms are excessive daytime sleepiness, which is reported in about 50% of cases. So for those of you out there listening that have concussion patients reporting excessive daytime sleepiness, or for those of you that are concussion patients, you can probably attest to the fact that you have increased daytime sleepiness. And that's 50% of cases. 33% of cases report insomnia at night, not being able to sleep. Half of those report that their insomnia is trouble falling asleep. And then the other half report that it's trouble staying asleep or frequent waking. So this can hit from a number of different ways uh, and a number of different things. So there are a number of reasons why sleep can be affected following concussion. One, there is evidence of reduced melatonin production. Melatonin is the sleep hormone. It is uh, released by the, the pineal gland in full darkness. So light stimulation, when light hits your retina, it suppresses melatonin production, which then prevents you from sleeping because you need melatonin production to have sleep onset. Um, and we're going to talk more about that uh, coming up. Um, number two, there's also some evidence that the neurometabolic cascade of concussion, what it does uh, in terms of all that neuronal firing after injury and the release of glutamate, that that can affect the circadian rhythm following concussion. So your circadian rhythm, excuse me, is your sleep-wake cycle. So you're awake in the day, you're asleep at night, that is your normal circadian rhythm. The concussion injury, the, the stuff that happens at the time of injury has uh, been shown or is thought at least to affect the circadian rhythm. Uh, and number three, other hormone imbalances. So melatonin is probably the most well-known hormone with, associated with sleep, but there's also other hormones that are involved in sleep and wakefulness. And recent evidence demonstrates that there's tremendous amount of hormonal imbalances in patients following concussion. As many as 30% of patients uh, six months or more after injury uh, have been shown to have different uh, imbalances in hormones. And some of these hormones are involved in sleep and wakefulness. Um, so to understand how this works and why what I'm going to talk about in terms of uh, blue light stimulation, how sleep uh, actually works. And this is going to be by no means an exhaustive explanation of how sleep works because it's an extremely complex process. But in a nutshell, throughout your day, 
uh, you get a buildup of substances and that creates kind of this sleep debt which makes you fatigued. One of those substances is adenosine which is a byproduct of energy use. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the energy molecule that we use for our bodily processes. Over the course of a day as you're burning energy and doing stuff, you have um, an increase in buildup of adenosine. You also have an increased buildup of cytokines, which is your immune cells. Um, and this buildup is what makes you feel sleepy. This is often why when you're fighting a cold or infection, you do feel the urge to sleep more because of the increased inflammatory and immune response, which also is present following concussion. As these build up, you get more fatigued. Um, if you get a certain amount of good deep sleep, so your non-REM sleep in your deep sleep, your slow wave sleep, if you get a good amount of that in the night, you actually restore those adenosine levels and reduce those inflammatory mediators for the next morning, which then allows you to have no sleep debt and you're awake and alert the next day. So that's kind of that, that rhythm is you have this buildup of stuff over the day, you restore it overnight, and then you build up again over the day and you have kind of this, this ongoing fluctuation. Melatonin also starts to get secreted at night when you're in total darkness. So the darker it is, the better, it, the more melatonin secretion you get. This is why things like screens um, can affect your sleep at night. And the big perpetrator of this is blue light. Blue light is the thing that is your body is very sensitive to um, in terms of your production of melatonin. So some people will actually wear blue light blocking glasses uh, at night. This is why you should be dimming lights in your house and avoiding screens before you go to bed because the blue light that's pushed from this actually reduces the secretion of melatonin from the pineal gland and will effectively what's called phase shift your sleep onset, which means your sleep onset won't happen until later, which means you'll have difficulty falling asleep. All right. Um, so if blue light suppresses melatonin, how can blue light also be helpful? So this is the question and it's all about timing. I'm all stuffed up now. Blue light in the nighttime is bad, but blue light in the morning can actually have the opposite effect where it helps to regulate and kickstart your circadian rhythm. So uh, the full-on circadian rhythm is regulated by what's called the super or the suprachiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus. When light hits the retina, um, it it projects um, it stimulates um, melanopsin-based intrinsically photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Say that a few times. IPRGCs. These cells are sensitive to wavelengths in the blue or sensitive to light, sorry, in the blue spectrum of, of uh, the range. So when these, these cells are stimulated, um, it suppresses the production of melatonin. So again, like I said, blue light, bad at night, because that delays the onset of sleep. But blue light in the morning suppresses melatonin, increases uh, wakefulness, and essentially makes it phase shift sleep the other way. So now, because of you're doing it in the morning, it stimulates that wakefulness response, which then creates your sleep onset to happen earlier in the evening, provided you're not suppressing it later on with other you know, bad, unhealthy practices. So blue light therapy has become an interest in concussion patients because it has been found to reduce daytime fatigue, reduce daytime sleepiness, and improve alertness throughout the day. Uh, blue light therapy has also been shown to be effective in treating some forms of depression, which often overlap some of these sleep difficulties. So it's become an interest of concussion researchers is how can we use blue light to potentially biohack or body hack our bodies into resetting our circadian rhythm, which has become disrupted by a concussion injury. And the reason I'm on this kick is there was a study published in December of 2019, which I found very interesting. This was one of the first randomized placebo controlled trials using blue light versus a placebo in patients with persistent concussion symptoms. So what they did is a smaller sample, so you have to keep this in mind, but they had 34 adult patients that were randomized into one of two groups. 
Group one received daily blue light therapy. Group two did the exact same protocol, but their light was amber. So this is where you control for the placebo, right? Because if you give people any type of intervention, they may get better just on the fact that you're intervening. So you have to intervene with everybody, but you have to just change what the intervention is to know if it's actually the thing that's treating them or if it's just the fact that you're intervening. So this is where the amber light comes in. Uh, and both groups did 30 minutes of daily light exposure within two hours of waking up. And they kept this in a journal. And what they did is they had a um, subjective and objective measurement of sleep uh, quality, daytime sleepiness. So they wore these wrist uh, watches called actinographs that measured how well they were sleeping at night, measured how long they were in each phase cycle of their sleep. Um, and then they also recorded journals of what they felt daytime sleepiness. They would do daytime sleepiness rating scales and other outcome measures. So they had those subjective measures, the reporting, and then they also had objective, which was actually measuring their sleep quality, when they fell asleep, how long they were asleep for, et cetera, when they woke up, all this type of stuff. So they did it before the therapy, and then they did six weeks of therapy, and then they were measured again on all of this stuff. Now after six weeks uh, of treatment, the blue light group had a significant phase advancement in sleep onset, mean, meaning they fell asleep much earlier or significantly earlier uh, after blue light therapy than they were before blue light therapy. One hour was the average. So the group in the blue light therapy, morning blue light therapy was falling asleep on average of one hour earlier every single night and the group in the amber light was falling asleep actually 15 minutes later by the end of the six weeks. So it had basically no effect. Um, but the blue light group was falling asleep one hour earlier. Blue light group was also waking up one hour earlier. So it, it basically effectively phase shifted their entire sleep cycle um, to be one hour earlier. The amber light group was actually waking up 16 minutes earlier. So they were falling asleep 15 minutes later, waking up 16 minutes later or earlier, their sleep, their overall sleep had actually contracted, whereas the blue light group, their overall sleep had actually just shifted over. Uh, the blue light group reported reduced daytime sleepiness. 87.5% of the blue light group uh, showed reduced sleepiness scores from pre-intervention to post-intervention. The conclusions of this particular study, our findings are consistent with well-established evidence that blue light exposure affects the timing of sleep-wake cycles through stimulation of the retinohypothalamic system. So that's your system where your eyes are connected with your hypothalamus to release certain chemicals and compounds to allow you to sleep or be awake. Um, this is something that has been interesting to me. Sleep has uh, just recently become more and more interesting to me in terms of just performance and ultimately just feeling better throughout the day and things like that. Uh, and over Christmas, I even bought myself a, an aura ring and I've been kind of monitoring my sleep, but because we've been sick and up with a baby and everything, it's been kind of a mess. Um, but anyway, I've gotten into it. And after reading that paper, I also bought my own little blue light thing here. For those of you watching, you can see it, but look how bright this bad boy is. It's crazy bright. Um, I just bought it on Amazon. I'm going to do a post on my Instagram on this and I'm going to put some more details in about um, what wavelengths of light and if you're interested in doing this, what type of light might may be uh, the most benefit for you. But this is something I've started doing in the morning now is when I come down here before I start work, I just literally you put it at a 30 degree angle from your face and you just turn it on and I'll just start doing my work with that there. You do it for half an hour and you just turn the light off and that's it. Um, like I said, because things have been so broken, I haven't really got a good grasp on, on the differences yet, but I have my aura ring to track how I'm doing. So I'll update you on progress as I go through this. But this is an easy, fairly inexpensive way to potentially hack your way into a better night's sleep. Concussion or not, um, this might just help the general population in terms of getting a better night's sleep, having increased mood and all that other stuff, particularly for us in the Northern Hemisphere where we don't get as much sunlight in the winter. Whoa, wait, 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 just one more thing before you go. This episode is brought to you by the Complete Concussion Management Clinical Network. Are you suffering from concussion symptoms that just aren't getting better? Maybe you're in the wrong place. Maybe you're seeing the wrong healthcare professional. Visit completeconcussion.com slash find dash a dash clinic. 
find all the local professionally trained concussion rehab individuals in your area. Each of our partnered clinics have gone through extensive training on concussion assessment, management, diagnosis, treatment, and rehabilitation. Uh, they're going to work with you to try and find the root cause of your symptoms and then develop a treatment plan and approach to help get rid of them. If you don't know what's driving the symptoms, you can't ever help or hope to fix them. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. They have a 98% patient satisfaction rating and have a higher net promoter score than Amazon, Apple, and Netflix. CompleteConcussions.com slash find a clinic. You will not regret it.